So it looks like we're starting with Liz. Oh, Mensa. Yeah, this is great. Mensa doesn't know how to handle passwords. No. The thing it's like a Saturday Night Live skit, you know? Yeah. They think they're so smart, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> they've got some issues. So uh, they got hacked and attacked. And um, th it was actually apparently a big deal for them. They, uh, two of their board members quit. Uh, and I, I mean, the stuff that was leaked out there was pretty bad. Uh, uh, they, they got the list there. You can see the IQ scores of members and failed applicants and uh, <laughs> EMs, payment card details, passwords, uh, PII. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. I took some Mensa tests at one time. People talked about it and I couldn't pass them. They were questions like, what kind of wine goes with this? And what was in this Italian opera? And I said, this is not my idea of IQ. This is just a measure of, are you rich? But anyway. Yeah. I've seen I've seen IQ tests like that. And I, I remember, I mean, I, I remember taking one uh, when I was a teenager that was like, uh, you know, had questions like who wrote Faust and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, there are, I know a lot of smart 14 year olds and most of them have never heard of Goethe from the 1600s. So, I mean, I, yeah, I, think, I, there, I think there's some flaws in that system. I prefer Densha, you know, the bottom 5% anyway. Yeah, I just think of the, the <clears throat> what is it, Harpo Marx? Uh, uh, who always said like I or Groucho, one of one of the Marx brothers always said he'd never uh, join a club that would have him as a member. And yeah. Mark Twain also. And I, I think um, anyway, this by the way, I think it's actually applicable to security programs in general. That when you are an arrogant idiot that think you know everything, you are going to do the stupidest stuff. Like all the companies I know, the boss has a password like one two three or something because yeah. he's above all your pathetic security rules. Yeah. Well, and it reminds me of Trump. He wouldn't, uh, he, he used the same vulnerable phone uh, all the time and his staff was always like arguing with him, trying to, they, they'd give him like a fully, um, fully updated patched iPhone with all the contacts and settings in it and try to switch it out every month and he would always refuse. I wondered about that because Obama loved his BlackBerry. And when he got in, they said, well, you can't use your BlackBerry anymore. You have to use our special hardened military device and he put up with it. And then I never was clear what Trump was using, but it sure seemed like it was just an everyday ordinary iPhone. It was, and they were all as frustrated because they, he wouldn't hand it over for them to inspect it and make sure it hadn't been compromised. He wouldn't let them apply patches to it. And I mean, it wasn't even like he needed to do anything. They would hand him a fresh phone with all of his stuff in there every month and he yep. still refused. Yeah, well, a lot of people are that way. They, they love their phone, you know? That's the whole thing about the iPhone. People, it's like jewelry. It's like part of your body. Anyway. Anyway, then we got Urban with Chromebooks. Chromebooks have gone up in sales last year. Hmm. I'll figure. And it looks like they're going to continue that trend this year. Uh, the reason why I put it in here is now that Chromebooks are going up, in sales and usage, they're going to go up in finding vulnerabilities and being an exploit that just like everything else. Mm -hmm. so I imagine, just, but the general model of the, uh, the Chromebook is not bad. I mean, it's just basically a big iPhone, right? A big Android phone. And so it's, it's really limited. I don't think you can just put on random software, right? You can only put on stuff from the Chrome store or something. You can start putting things that are outside of that in, in there. You can run crossover in it. Oh, you but can the run other other programs. Okay, fair enough. It, it so is, I'm sure you could get it owned. It, it, right, it, it is, you can't do more things with it than what we're used to with it. Uh, but it's, it's just one of those like, okay, if it's getting big, it's gonna get attacked just like Zoom did when we started this whole pandemic. Yeah, I imagine it will. It certainly seems like a good idea though. I mean, I remember back when my whole extended family had Windows PCs, I'd spent all my time fixing them and then I got them to get Macs and they were okay because a normal human being can actually like use a Mac for a year or two without ruining it. And I think the same thing's true of Chromebook. A normal person can do normal things on it for a while. They're yep. starting to get to the point where you can even run like VMs on them and stuff. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, it's starting to get there. Yeah. Well, anyway, 
They're certainly popular with schools because I think it's the cheapest machine you can give your students that they can actually use and you won't have to spend too much time doing tech support on it. Yep. Right. Yep. And then Alan's got uh, COBOL. What was this about COBOL? Well, Sam, bad news for you and your embrace of COBOL. Me? It's just possible that COBOL is less important to the world than has been widely reported. Ding. Apparently, these figures that often get cited about COBOL being nearly ubiquitous, how there are hundreds of billions of lines, and how, uh, how much of the world economy is dependent on COBOL may be exaggerated, which is not to say that it's irrelevant, it's no longer used, it certainly is. It's just that these figures that are so widely uh, repeated uh, all come from a study or a survey that was done in 1997 with really bad methodology in which the surveying company uh, pulled just a few companies that uh, operated mainframe computers and relied on mainframe computers for their business. And then they extrapolated across uh, the entire world based on that extremely small and unrepresentative sample. So all these figures that we've been hearing about COBOL being so important and so widely used, probably much exaggerated mm. and badly out of date at that. Well, I must protest on the grounds that 1997 is what passes for pretty current at the rate of COBOL. You have to renormalize <laughs> your thinking. <laughs> I mean, that's just yesterday in okay. the world of COBOL. But anyway, all I, right. Well, <laughs> go ahead. I'll, I'll right. concede then. Uh, I retract everything I said. Well, there you go. <laughs> just as important as ever. I met a vociferous bunch of mainframe uh, supporters on Twitter, and they're like, "Yeah, mainframes matter. Stop picking on us, you <laughs> idiot. You just don't know how great they are." There's a bunch of them. They're out there. <laughs> they're a proud, you know, fraternity of mainframe maintainers and stuff. Anyway. And the world still needs them, but not for much longer, perhaps. Yeah, that's what they always say. You know, when the sun <laughs> cools and, and the last people on Earth are alive, they'll still be programming COBOL anyway. <laughs> so this, I thought, was awesome. This is Kashmir Hill, who does a lot of stories like this. And so this, um, this guy, Guy Babcock, um, got a call from I could tr years ago from his family. He said, hey, somebody Googles, you know, all this horrible stuff comes up. And it turns out that there are all these memes up there saying he's a pedophile and a thief and everything. And it also all of his kids and his grandkids and everything. And this went on for years. And there were special websites just to post this stuff. The one that started it all was sort of a revenge porn site for like other kinds of slander where they put up anything and then they'll charge you $2,000 to take it down. And then everybody copies them. What's that? Is there, a, is there a story to go with this? Yeah, isn't it on the page? Oh, my page is not. Oh, my. Oh, that just happened to me before. My Zoom is failing to update properly. Okay, um, I know the solution. Uh, I'm oh. going to pause the recording because this is pretty painful. All right, so now we got the share working. And uh, anyway, so he found all these. All these relatives are also being hit, and this went on for years. He didn't pay the 2000 bucks. He got a lawyer. He got a private detective to hunt down people, tried to find out what's going on. And it turned out it was this one crazy woman who had done this over and over and over. And she just seems to be psychotic. She denies it. She did it to everybody she ever dealt with. She like got uh, rejected for a loan and then her home got foreclosed. So she did this to the bank and everybody posts all these memes accusing them of being pedophiles and everything. And you can't do anything about it. You can hire all the lawyers you want. They can't get her prosecuted for anything. They can't make people take the pages down. It's been going on for years. And by the end of this research, she's doing it to Kashmir Hill, the woman that wrote the article. Wow. She's just spending her whole life spreading this filth everywhere. And there really is almost nothing anybody can do about it. That's her. Or that was one of the lawyers who was harassment. And here's the woman doing it. Yeah, that's her. Mrs. Atlas, Atus, is the one doing all this. And I've known people like this. Maybe you have. I had a student in one of my classes like this that would just like scream and rave about people and try to post things on the internet about how they should all be killed or something. There's just a certain amount of psychos out there. And 
that's the point of this, which is a lot of what Cashmere Hill has done, privacy articles and stuff. If somebody just does this to you, there's really nothing you can do about it. It's the huge issue of content moderation on the internet. You know, if there's something awful up there, there just aren't anything resembling proper rules or ways to get it down or limits or ways to sue people and stop it or anything right now. So you can spend years suffering for this. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it, and it's a wonderful story. And you know, I think it's part of the giant pylon because of the last couple of elections. Everybody is really saying, you know, we really need rules on the internet, rules on content moderation. This is just getting out of hand to where something must be done. Although we're not having much luck agreeing on what's gonna be done. Anyway, I thought that was an awesome article. And uh, so now we got a cyber intelligence officer. Yeah, this is just kind of a crazy story um, yeah. uh, that really, uh, the more I read about it, the more it sounded like something off of a TV show. Um, this lady was a, a cyber ops whiz that, that worked for um, various three letter agencies over 20 years and then um, she just went on this, she like totally went rogue, basically. Um, and uh, it all started like a year and a half ago. And she um, went to Mexico and then contacted the Russians and, uh, and uh, offered to um, sell them a bunch of, uh, of top secret um, intelligence stuff. And then... Um, in exchange for a bunch of money and, and, and uh, you know, safe harbor in a country with no extradition <laughs> treaty um, and uh, uh, trying to, she basically tried to like kidnap her own daughter, uh, which ha that happens a lot, um, you know, in, in parental, you know, family court custody cases, but uh, then that was what finally got her. That was what finally got her caught. Um, but usually it's not uh, intelligence agents doing the uh, parental kidnapping. So this was just a really wild story, I thought. Um, and, you know, yeah, so, sort, of, sort of some of the things that make me think that sometimes we ought to like rethink our um, risk model or examine it a little bit, you know, when we're um, granting people uh, clearance every, and it was funny, you know, everybody, when, when Trump got elected and stuff, stuff started happening, you know, it really made me think that, uh, you know, there might be some issues here with national security because, um, you know, a person like that's just like granted the highest level of clearance uh, that you can get. And I think that we're going to be seeing for years to come some of the repercussions from that. So. Well, I think we are. And I think and the thing I see is just from a business point of view, some large percentage of employees, like 2% or 5% are just completely insane, like on drugs or something, and they'll just do crazy stuff. And uh, you have to be aware of that. I remember there was a story like this a few years ago about one of the astronauts just getting her lover killed while she was somewhere else. It's just the, every group of people, no matter how elite, seems to have these psychos in there. Yeah, and I mean, maybe it's just like human nature because there's always a percentage of people, no matter what, that are going to be crazy. But, you know, it's interesting just when, when, you know, when you think about the rigorous clearance process that someone like this woman had to go through and knowing the system and knowing that you're probably going to get, you know, tracked down and prosecuted at the very least, uh, still doing it. Um, it's just, inter just interesting. Yeah, it is important, I think. That's why, uh, you know, if you're trying to do something about this, like after the Snowden revelation, every company is trying to make sure they don't have somebody disloyal who's going to deliberately breach security and they're selling products to supposedly vet your people to find them, but it's really no more than the witch sniffers. I mean, how do you know which of your employees yeah, is really that's... unhappy and likely to betray you you never know. Yeah, and there's so many. I mean, that's part of the thing that makes insider threat so tricky because there's so many different motivations, and you never really know 
um, you know, you really can never stay on top of all of those. You know, some people do it for money. Some people do it for activism. Some people just do it because they're crazy. Yeah. And, you, you know, and I don't think you can, some of those, some of those products too, that they're selling for that are so stupid because all they are is like, anomaly detection or hey is this person exfiltrating a large amount of data from their workstation and it's like you should be watching for that stuff anyway yeah. but if it makes you feel better to buy a product or a service to do it okay <laughs> yeah well i understand that i mean um security uh, executives want to just hit something with a hammer and say there it's solved but it's not that simple yeah well anyway then um then we got Urban's machine learning. Okay. So this is a start. I wouldn't freak out about it just yet for those who are scared of machine learning and AI. Uh, this, this is the start to getting AI to join offensive security. So it was a very much a tested environment uh, where a lot of things were assumed and, and purposefully set up but they were able to use that reinforced learning to get this AI to do SQL I on a, on a system. But again, it wasn't like the, the thing did it completely on its own. It, it had a lot of assumptions and a lot of, of a setup for it. That's pretty it's, cool. They gave it a capture the flag. It's the same thing we do with our students. Exactly. So it wasn't able to do it. Capture the flag. <laughs> yeah, it was able to do it, but again, it, it was, it's very preliminary. It wasn't, you know, completely on its own, but it's definitely going to get there eventually. You know, a few years ago, I think MIT made one that will do buffer overflows, but it wasn't AI. It just had an algorithm. It will fuzz the server until it crashes. It will then try a pattern of buffer overflows. It will then inject the egg and they said it can automatically exploit a buffer overflow as long as you're like willing to like restart the service like 200 times as it keeps crashing it over and over. Right. So yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. It'll get there eventually, but it's yeah. interesting to see the the progress. No, AI weapons are totally coming, and we need AI defenses, which I think are already there. It's mm -hmm. the next thing, and AI is really a lot less scary. When I I read go to articles and learned what it is, machine learning is in fact what I used to do when I was a beginning scientist. You you just measure something, you make a graph, then you draw like a line through it and try to fit it with something. That's all it is. And it tries like, you know, 50 different kinds of curve to find the best one that fits. And then it calls that a model. That's fundamental basic science. That's how we discovered like gravity and electricity and everything. You just measure something and draw a curve through it and then try to make up some math. Mm -hmm. Not anything super fantastic or scary. I just anyway, hope then, that these uh, AI technologies don't get too sophisticated because I worry about the impact on security jobs. Oh, well, well, you know, I'm, I guess I grew up on like idealistic Star Trek. The idea is when the, when the robots do all the work, the people will just sort of lounge around and eat grapes and discuss poetry, right? They won't have to do all the work. Or the AIs will, you know, get guns and start slaughtering us because what good are we anyway? Yes, I, uh, I'm more concerned about the Skynet future. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, it could go one way or the other, right? The singularity. <laughs> It's a little disturbing that they already have murder drones, so. Yeah, well, and they're actually trying to give them uh, Asimov's three laws, or is it Clark's three laws? Anyway, so you got energy inefficiency. Yes, this is an interesting article from IEEE Spectrum. Um, despite all the talk about the US government transitioning to an all electric vehicle fleet, and GM transitioning to all electric uh, vehicles being manufactured. It turns out that today, the US is wasting more energy than it was back in 1950. Um, the really shocking figure is that for every joule that is properly used, over two joules are wasted. Well, and, I'm not surprised by this. Because well, electric generation is in electric power lines are incredibly inefficient. That is true. And electric generation using coal and natural gas are not terribly efficient either. Yeah. Coal is something like 38% efficient and natural gas is only 44%. Yeah. 
Mm. Now, that yes. doesn't necessarily mean that natural gas is a terrible polluter um, in terms of carbon output. But uh, nevertheless, there is a lot of energy being wasted across the US. And this article highlights two areas in particular, transportation and buildings. In the case of transportation, even though internal combustion engines are significantly more efficient now today than they were say in the 1970s, people are driving bigger cars and they're driving more greater distances and they're also flying more or were. And so overall, we're using more energy that way and thus more energy is being wasted in terms of uh, uh, number of people transported per mile, et cetera. And then for buildings, um, once again, building efficiency has gone up thanks to. Uh oh, I think we lost Alan. He's frozen 80. Uh, maybe. Yep. Well, anyway, I'm uh, actually, I wonder about this because I think. Um, the move to electric cars is not actually going to save the planet. It's just going to mean we breathe less smog in the cities. I think it will mean they actually burn more stuff out in where the power plant is and pollute the earth more. Unless they go fully renewable energy. Or nuclear, yeah. And, or I, think, nuclear. and I think the other thing is, um, this is like ethanol. A lot of these so-called environmental movements actually make things worse. It's... Uh, a lot of them are just theater for politicians to win an election by making it look like they've done something. Anyway, looks like, uh, well, I think we better just go on and let Alan recover when he can. Um, and I wanted to talk about this uh, politics stuff, which I thought was very interesting. And um, so, there's, there's a historical figure of the know-nothings. The know-nothings were a party uh, back in like the 1800s when the Irish immigrants were coming in. So they formed a huge party against blaming immigrants for everything and hating immigrants and closing the borders like Trump. And they had both the North and the South in it. So they carefully avoided the issue of slavery to hold it together. And they got to where they had like 40 candidates in state houses and uh, representatives and stuff. They didn't get the presidency, although they ran... Um, Millard Fillmore was their candidate from the Know Nothing Party, which was very much like QAnon. And then it all just fell apart um, because they split over the issue of slavery and other things. But you know, this has happened before when we, and they totally relied on conspiracy theories and just madness about how accusing these Irish immigrants of just doing all this stupid stuff that was insane. So it's very much like the, the rise of Trump and his gang. And this is something I hadn't realized. Kinzinger is one of the 10 Republicans that voted to impeach Trump. And he is a new Republican, newly in the House. And he he voted against, and he, he talks like, you know, uh, Mitch Romney. There's a few Republicans that talk like Republicans used to 10 years ago, where they said, I don't know what this nonsense is about conspiracy theories and that the election was rigged. That's all garbage. I just want to, you know, like uh, balance the budget and have a strong military or something. And he, um, but his friends, and his family sent him certified letters saying that he was now working for Satan and they had dis they've disowned him and he's not in their family anymore and stuff to punish him for not supporting Trump. And it, it brings up the issue that I've seen before that um, this is not a political party, it's a religion. And Trump is like a TV evangelist and they tie it into this, um, this religious issue. And anyway, I thought the nicest summary was this woman's TikTok where she says the same thing Trump says. She says, how, how come you Biden supporters don't have huge rallies and carrying flags and 10,000 of you driving your cars around in boats? You must not really have any Biden supporters, which is why Trump said the election must be rigged because Biden will have a rally. There's only 30 people there socially distanced. I have a rally, 10,000 people screaming, obviously I'm gonna win. Nobody cares about Biden. And this woman is the Democrat. She said, you know, we Democrats just don't worship our leader like a God. We're just hiring the guy to do a job and we don't have to like wear flags and wear t-shirts and hats and praise him. And it's, it's very interesting to see that the, the Trump movement is really a religious cult. It's not really like a normal political action at all. Anyway, I thought it was uh, 
nice to see that. And I, I really, when I saw this Kinsinger, then I remembered something I'd forgotten because, you know, I grew up in, in fundamentalist Bible thumping Christianity in a rural town. Then I moved to the east, the coasts where you sort of forget about this. But the heartland of America is still basically a, uh, a fundamentalist, religious, crazed place. And I forgot about the Trump is somehow Jesus and resisting Trump is somehow the devil. And just like those TV evangelists, somehow the fact that he is absolutely the opposite in every way of what all your values claim to be doesn't bother them at all. Yeah. The, the fact he's that he's obviously well. corrupt. Yeah, good. Somehow it's he's a family value, the mascot of the family values party with the worst family values imaginable. Yeah, and his third wife with like 20 women claiming he sexually molested them, running strip cubs, <laughs> paying off prostitutes. And he's like the icon of Christian conservative values. It's somehow they love that. I think it's some kind of animal instinct that you want to worship the the leader of your tribe and he should have access to all the women and that's right and proper or something like that. Anyway, it needs like a real psychologist to figure it out. Anyway. Um, yeah. I remember when I was a kid, the youth pastor of my church ran off with the director of the youth group and uh, they started their affair like when they were taking the kids, uh, taking us on a mission trip somewhere. So basically they ended up like totally neglecting the kids and uh, cheating on their spouses with each other on this church trip. Yeah, I've talked to Irvin about this. This is what always happens with those TV evangelists. They are caught like having sex with a 12 year old boy or something. It's always this weird sexual stuff and stealing all the money. I used to think it was because of like the repressive nature of religion, but I don't think that anymore. I think they're just our opportunists. I think it's just power. And I think it was um, uh, one of the president's wives, uh, Adams, I think she said, all men would be tyrants if they could. You know, my mom said, men are no damn good. I think power just gives men the opportunity to just exploit the people around them sexually, and they all do it when they get a chance. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, so that was, uh, I think we're back up to you. Did Alan ever make it back? Still muted or something, anyway. I'm back. Oh, you're back, good. Did you have more you wanted to say about that, the energy stuff? No. Oh, okay, good, glad you're back. This is the modern world. I noticed even like the official TV news and everything, people are all cutting in and out and on mute and having their dog barking and stuff. So our, uh, our standards are, are lowered down to where this home, uh, home theater stuff is about as good as it gets these days. Yes, uh, I live in a place that's been forsaken by the FCC. I th uh, it seems like we all are. I watch you mm -hmm. know, news interviews with like heads of state and their thing also garbles and cuts out on them. <laughs> I can't believe like in my new place still, I can't, I still can't get fiber internet and my uh, ISP options are just pathetic. Yeah. And I mean, it's, you know, this is the second place in the Bay Area that I've been like that, where it's like, you know, I'm less than half an hour from downtown San Francisco and yet I can't get decent internet. And I've got students that have just dropped out of college because it's absolutely impossible for them to find a computer and an internet connection good enough to tune into Zoom. They're just going to wait a year until they can get back to the lab on campus because there's nowhere in their life where they can actually like get a computer and open a browser and reach the internet. And this is crazy. I mean, this is one area where our government, our local and state government even have failed us because yeah. you know, we're especially right now seeing the effects of the digital divide on people. And, you know, cause somebody like me, I, Ian Allen, you know, we can find workarounds, you know, we're, we're, we have enough resources to be able to, um, you know, make something work. But for a lot of our students and a lot of people that, that live here, that's really not the case, especially for um, kids who are trying to, trying to keep up with school and everything. So, I mean, we really, allowed the government to hose us on telecoms and i think right now we're starting to see just how devastating that is for people i remember obama ran on that 
that was to me the most appealing part of his platform was he was going to do a new fiber backbone and it would hire all my fiber optic students to lay it. So I thought that was great. And then he totally didn't do it because he wanted health care and Mitch McConnell blocked the health care and he spent his entire two terms fighting with the Republicans blocking his every move and nothing else got done. And, you know, I'm very concerned that Biden is going to do the same thing. He's going to let the Republicans block everything, accomplish nothing and lose the majority. So I hope he listens to people like um, Bernie Sanders that says, forget those Republicans, just ram it through with reconciliation, because in two years, you're going to either have accomplished something or you're going to lose. Right. Anyway, we'll see what happens. We'll see if Biden is just talking nice, but beating him with big club politely, or if he's actually going to be a wimp and let them jerk him around. Anyway, so we've got Emotet. Yeah, this uh, is kind of neat um, where uh, I thought it was interesting in that the Dutch cops have, have developed uh, two tools for um, people to be able to check and see whether um, they're, uh, one of them's just like, sort of like, have I been pwned where uh, that you can look up and see whether your email addresses and passwords have been um, compromised and then the other thing I think is very interesting, um, which actually leverages um, botnet servers. Um, it can it can um, disconnect uh, your if you if you hit the server and you're already infected, you, it'll disconnect uh, from the internet so that you won't propagate um, you won't propagate it further, uh, and it doesn't actually like fix the problem on, on the host system, but it does stop the spread, which I thought is pretty cool. Um, you know, and I'd like to see more of this approach happening where they're using, um, the authorities are actually using their power to help people out instead of just using it to bust people. Um, now this used to be considered, it sounds like it's gonna automatically disconnect you from the botnet without your participation. Um, well, I wouldn't say it's without your participation. You, um, well, I guess it could be. I guess it could be without your participation. Um, the way I read it originally was that you um, uh, deliberately um, connect but uh, to that uh, server, but actually now that I think about it, if you're infected, um, it's going to bring you into it. So yeah, it will be. Yeah, like 10 years ago, people started doing this and they were considered criminals. And they said, you know, if you write an antivirus virus, right. it's as much of a crime and three of them got out of control and turned out worse than the original thing. So, I mean, if, if governments are finally doing this, using the botnet to kill the botnet, that might be nice, but there are legal issues. Yeah, uh, that's true. Um, but I think it's interesting. Um, yeah. And apparently they found some way to uh, be able to do that. Um, they've been able to do that within the bounds of the law. And I thought it was interesting down at the end of the article that they said that law enforcement agencies from UK, Netherlands, Germany, France, Lithuania, Ukraine, and US and Canada mm -hmm. uh, participated in it. So you know, I guess we're involved somehow as well. <laughs> well, I've been hearing in the last few years, Microsoft has been taking down botnets. So more and more we're using these techniques that originally were considered sort of black hat techniques. And they've mm -hmm. sort of found ways to uh, give them uh, government approval. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, but, yeah. That's good. If you can, if you can, you know, I think it is important to adapt your policy um, to changing times. And, um, you know, that, I think that's a, po I think that's a positive thing. It can be, I just, you know, you see how the standards evolve. Yeah. I mean, now we don't think much of this for 10 years ago, everyone would have freaked out and said, the government is running code on my machine without my permission. Oh, I'm, this is an outrage. Anyway. Um, so Pixlr got hacked. Just another one of many resources out there that were hacked and phishing and targeted stuff or credential stuffing attacks and the um, the credentials were posted out to the world and now they're part of uh, how I've been pwned if I'm not mistaken. Yep. 
He dumped him out publicly, which makes you wonder why they do this. I guess because he couldn't get anybody to pay for it or something. I guess. But yeah, more stuff to look up if you have a, a Pixlr account. Yep. Got to use a password manager and different passwords on every site. Yep, yep. And Alan has got more Collapse OS, boy. Are you there? You're on mute, Alan, or maybe you're dead. I'm Aha. here, I'm here. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> yes. I can't get Collapse OS off my mind. And <laughs> after receiving hundreds of messages uh, from our, uh, among our millions of viewers who wanted to know more about Collapse OS, <laughs> I realized that although there may indeed be plenty of Z80 and AVR micro processors out there in the wild that can be used post collapse. Very few people know how to use them, program them, or turn them into uh, prepper computers. So here is an excellent resource to the many viewers who want to create their own Z80 computer. The book that you can read for free on Google Books, the title is Build Your Own Z80 Computer by Steve Ciarcia. And it's actually a really good book, I have to say. It, it, I haven't read much, I've just flipped through it a little bit, but it's got a lot of five-star reviews, as you can see, and on Amazon, a used copy sells for $55. So there's definitely a market for this. And the author does an excellent job of explaining some very low-level computing concepts, but in a very approachable way. There are lots of nice block diagrams. And uh, he tells you how to do everything from uh, building your own power supply to your own CRT monitor. Well, you don't make the CRT monitor, but you program it so that you can attach a CR monitor, CRT monitor to it. So this is probably the most comprehensible, uh, most approachable, and most educational resource on the internet for making your very own Z80 computer, circa 1981. So when society collapses, you're going to be the only one of us still teaching tech classes. We'll have I, to ride our so. donkeys to your place to do this. Yep. Yeah, yep. Well, yep. you know, I, I, I have to admit that my skill level is probably not quite up to snuff. I probably couldn't build my own Z80 computer right now. But uh, I figure since the collapse isn't coming until 2030, that I've got a few years to learn how to do all this. Yeah. I, how did they get that 2030 number? I don't know. <laughs> I remember it wasn't the Mayan calendar, which would have been my bet. But. Right, right. No, I, I think it just has to do with the uh, peak oil being last year, yeah. two years ago, and the acceleration of moral decline. Oh, that was it. Moral decline. Yeah. yeah. How could I forget the moral decline? Yeah. And uh, well, he's not entirely wrong about that. It, it, I, I've never seen it numerically quantified that way. <laughs> Well, it's not unlike the millenarian movements where there's this belief that, uh, you know, the apocalypse is coming and so on and so forth. No, it's not unlike it. And by the way, I'm expecting some serious moral decline later this year when the vaccine comes out. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. And so this I've, I've heard before, and here's another article showing it, that if you want to learn a language and you want to live coding, the thing to do is Java. Java has been the number one thing for years the most coders, and now they've proven not these people have the greatest job satisfaction, Java coders. Um, this, is, uh, this is what I've heard. Big companies, everything has to be in Java. And if you really learn your Java, you will have steady employment and be respected because it's pretty hard to do. And here's you know various uh, operation notes. Information security is down here at like six. And dentist is at 10. So, you know, these are the, these are, Java is the language if you want to really make your living coding. Uh, anyway, a lot of students always ask me, what language should I learn if I'm in security? And I say, well, it doesn't really matter, but you should know one. You should know like Python and maybe C. But if you actually want to use it and code for a living, Java is the thing. Anyway, any more comments? Other than happy 100. Yeah, happy 100. I love your 100 background. That's cool. All right, I'm stopping the recording.